To Kill a Mockingbird, winner of the Pulitzer Prize and just about every other award a book can win. And now, happily, To Kill a Mockingbird becomes a motion picture, and its memorable characters come vividly alive. That Scout, some people call her Jean Louise Finch, but she insists on Scout. And Atticus Finch, the father, whose devotion to justice places him and his children in jeopardy. I've been appointed to defend Tom Robinson. Now that he's been charged, that's what I intend to do. It's ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. It's Ticklish Business, the podcast devoted to honoring and deconstructing classic cinema. Once again, I'm Kristen here with Samantha. Kim is sitting this episode out. She will be back next time. But we are joined by an amazing guest in her place, author, classic film fan, Tom Santo Pietro. Tom, how are you? I am fine, thank you. And thank you both for having me on. It's great. Tom, you've written several books. Of course, we were looking at your book on why To Kill a Mockingbird Matters to discuss our film today, which is To Kill a Mockingbird from 1962. Before we get into that, of course, if you like what you're listening to and you want to help us out, head over to patreon.com slash ticklishbiz, where we have all sorts of bonus content and your help financially helps keep the lights on at Ticklish Biz HQ. So Tom, I'm curious, you wrote this book, Why to Kill a Mockingbird Matters. We're still talking about this movie so many decades later. The generic question is, what's your love for the film, or at least interest in it, and how did it translate into wanting to write this book? That's a good question, and I think for me it operates on two levels. First of all, I think it is a terrific film. Robert Mulligan is a director I admire a great deal. It's not a huge body of work, but he is really first rate, and so I was interested in that. I was interested in the fact that this is one of the very few instances, I believe, where a great novel was made into a great film. Because as I talk about in my book, there are no great film adaptations of F. Scott Fitzgerald. There are no great film adaptations of Ernest Hemingway. There are no, I feel, no great adaptations of William Faulkner. So this was a case where people loved the book, but they also loved the movie. The final reason I wanted to write about it actually only came to me as I was completing the first draft. Sometimes you write and you don't realize on the subtextual level what's going on. And all of a sudden I thought, oh, this completes my trilogy of books about family viewed through film, because the first one was The Godfather, which is all about family. The second one was The Sound of Music, which is about a very different sort of family, and now To Kill a Mockingbird. So that was kind of a light bulb moment for me. Working on a book about The Godfather and then working on a book about To Kill a Mockingbird, it's interesting. I revisited both books this year for a project, and the way the adaptation works in each of them is so different, I noticed, in what makes the screen and what doesn't. And can you talk a little bit about looking at, at those two works? Was one book easier to write than the other? Again, that's a really interesting question. I, I've never been asked which book was easier to, <laughs> to write. And <laughs> I think the answer is it was actually a little bit easier for me to write about Mockingbird. And the reason for that is my book on The Godfather called The Godfather Effect is the one and only book which is at all personal, where I talk about my life and my family. And weaving that in, when you delve into personal matters, it becomes a different entity. So I was very careful with that. And what I've always said is with the Godfather book, it's not necessarily the book that sold the most, but it is by far the book I've received the most mail, email, snail mail, phone calls about. And that's because of the family element and people relating to their own families. You're also, I would say, prolific. I don't know what how many books one has to write to be considered prolific. Author of biographies, at classic film biographies as well. You've written about Doris Day, which is a book that if people haven't read it, they should. For you, I guess, can you talk a little bit about not just juggling 
writing a book like this about adaptation and film analysis, but the interest in writing a biography about an entire person, that always seems very daunting to me. So I love asking authors about the process of showcasing a life on the page. I think that the impulse for writing about the biographies I've done, Barbara Streisand, Doris Day, Frank Sinatra, I very clearly have a fascination with singing actors. Yes. <laughs> because all three of them, you know, share the fact that they were huge movie stars and huge recording stars. And I think each one I approached slightly differently. You know, I wanted to write about Doris Day because here is this enormous talent who never got her full due. And she's a phenomenal talent. So that was that impulse. Sinatra, because he was this colossus of American culture in the 20th century. The light bulb moment for writing about Barbara was when I came across a quotation from Isabel Leonard, who wrote Funny Girl, and also, interestingly, wrote Doris Day's greatest movie, Love Me or Leave Me. And Isabel Leonard was talking about Barbara, and she said, Barbara Streisand has made life a hell of a lot better for a lot of homely little girls. And I thought, whoa, that is a really bold statement. I want to look at that. Something triggers the imagination. Do you have a preference either way on writing biography or looking at a specific film? It's just whatever's occupying my brain pan, admittedly small at times, <laughs> at the present time, what I really want to write about. So I'm actually right now working on two books, and one is a biography and one is about a film. So it's just what's motivating me, because as you both know, the impulse behind writing a book is you have an idea, something that really interests you, and you just want to share it. I just want to get it out there and see, are there other people that are interested in this the way I am? And that's the unknown. And that's what's really the most interesting part once the book is published. Can you say what either of the books that you're currently working on are? Or are they still top secret? I can tell you about one of them. We'll take I, it. <laughs> I, I always wait until the books are reality in the sense of a signed contract. My, so my background is I've worked on Broadway, managing right. shows for a long time. And, you know, books fall apart the way Broadway shows fall apart. I always wait. But yes, the book I can talk about is I've written a it's a pretty full-scale biography of Audrey Hepburn. Wow, that is so exciting. Yeah. With all um, the new information that's come out about Audrey Hepburn in the last few years, I think it's super relevant and super exciting. Oh, well, I'm glad to, of course, glad to hear you say that. What made it really great was that Audrey's son, Sean, and her granddaughter, Emma, were really cooperated with me. So I felt like I was really delving into not just the public Audrey, but the private Audrey as well. And I can say she was a phenomenal human being. There's no other way to say it. That was an extraordinary spirit. The book will be out next year. And uh, I hope that Audrey fans will like it. Well, already we're going to have to have you back next year to talk <laughs> Audrey. So this is, this is happening. Get into the real deep cuts. <laughs> exactly before we get into it here's a short little ad for our patreon if you are a fan of old hollywood classic entertainment and the joy of pop culture history in all its forms please subscribe to our patreon page like these wonderful people christine meyer danny david floyd jacob haller mcf and rachel kramarchuk our patreon is located at patreon.com slash ticklish biz a special reminder, if we can get up to 100 subscribers, we're looking forward to posting a deep dive into an infamous movie in ticklish business circles. Does love truly mean never having to say you're sorry? Well, if we can get to our goal, you'll hear all of our opinions on love story. Trust me, there's a lot of them. Will you be in Los Angeles for this year's TCM Classic Film Festival? If so, be on the lookout for Kristen and Kim, as we'll be giving away a prize pack to one lucky winner, courtesy of the fine folks at Breakfast at Dominique's when you're putting old Hollywood glamour into every cup of coffee. If you see us at the fest, just use the code word Crawford to see if you're a winner. No purchase is necessary. And if you're not at the festival, no worries. You can also enter to win another prize from Breakfast at Dominique's by just subscribing to our Instagram at ticklishbiz 
telling us your favorite classic film and tagging a friend who might enjoy a cup of coffee alongside a classic movie with you. Now, back to the show. But of course, we're talking about To Kill a Mockingbird, which is celebrating an anniversary of this year, directed by Robert Mulligan, a screenplay by Horton Foote, but based on the novel of the same name by Harper Lee, starring Gregory Peck, Mary Batum, Brock Peters, a lot of great actors in this movie. It tells the story of a young girl named Scout, as she goes through her early adolescence living with her father, Atticus Finch, who is an attorney played by Gregory Peck. And things turn when he takes on the case of a Black man in the South accused of rape of a white woman. And the kids experience racism for the first time and all sorts of other things. This is a movie that I saw once several years ago. And I didn't really appreciate it. And then I revisited it this last year and at the same time. So I watched them at the same time and I read the book. And I really came to appreciate not just what Robert Mulligan does, but what Horton Foote does in taking Harper Lee's book, which really does feel kind of like a slice of life. It's broken up into vignettes. There's a lot more discussion about the history of the town that the Scout is living in. You know, she goes on a whole section about like her teacher's backstory in the book. And you know, Horton Foote creates this film that has more of a narrative, I think, than the book. Even though the beats of the film are all in Harper Lee's novel, there's more of a meandering kind of sense of this being reminiscences and memories of Scout's past than necessarily the film is, which I find really interesting. And I loved seeing how Atticus Finch changes on the screen. Gregory Peck said that like for good and bad, he'll always be Atticus Finch, which just feels like a very different Atticus Finch than Harper Lee's Atticus Finch. So I really came to appreciate the nature of adaptation with this movie because there are, as Tom, you astutely pointed out, you know, some authors just don't translate to the screen. And I can only imagine the daunting job Horton Foote had to bring this film to the screen, considering how beloved the book is. I would agree with everything you just said. And one of the points I wanted to make in my book is, it's a funny thing to call somebody an unsung hero when they've won the Academy Award. But I think Horton Foote is the unsung hero of the book, because the book is a mood piece. And it's very difficult to translate that to the screen. But To me, I really put him on the same notch as a playwright with Tennessee Williams and Arthur Miller. I think he is that great. And the reason why he was the perfect choice for the movie is because he understood small town Southern America in the same way that Harper Lee understood it. So Harper Lee, having grown up in a very small town in Alabama, was investigating, of course, the racism that was so prevalent at the time. And the reason why I think Horton Foote was the best possible adapter is because what he was after was the loneliness right underneath the surface of small town America, the kind of desperate lives that certain people live. So he understood the milieu in his bones, and that translates on the screen. It's the same way The Godfather, one of the big thing that works is because Francis Ford Coppola understood that story in his bones. And I always say with The Godfather, Francis Ford Coppola is the only director who would have said when it came time to film Marlon Brando's death scene in the garden with his little grandson, Francis Ford Coppola is the only one that would have said, make sure that garden is only planted with Italian plum tomatoes. That's understanding the milieu and Horton Foote understood that small town, Alabama, in his bones. Exactly. Samantha, what's your background with this film? I know you have a very different view of this movie than I do. And I guess the question that I'm going to ask you is, why do you not like this movie? (laughs) (laughs) Good. Controversy. (laughs) I know. I know. It really is. To come on here after all of the praise that you two have heaped on, I've been like, I don't like this movie. I have a bit of a complicated relationship with this film. I mean, I watched it and read the book in high school, of course. It's almost required at this point. And I didn't have an appreciation for the film at all back then. I come at this from a very biased viewpoint. I was a child who grew up in the South. And I really love 
escapism on film. I like to be transported to a whole other world. I want to, you know, deal with people and meet people in books and on film that are not similar to me in any way, shape, or form. And reading To Hill a Mockingbird and watching the film felt really, really close to home in a way that I didn't like. And for that reason, I just never happened to revisit it until this week. And watching the film again, which, you know, I hadn't seen it since high school, I have much more of a respect for it. And the courtroom aspects of the film were always the parts that drew me in because I have the interest in law and the interest in true crime. And those are still the parts that I gravitate towards. But I think the filmmaking as a whole, the way that they treat the material and the shots that they get, they really depict that Southern life, which I have the experience with so well. And I have to give it credit for that. That's interesting. Your response has changed. It sounds to me, could we say that you're giving it a grudging acceptance now? I think the (laughs) plot will always just be okay to me as someone who's basically had the same sort of upbringing as like Scout. That's never going to be the type of film that I gravitate towards. But now that I am able to view it through the lens of someone who studied film and appreciated filmmaking and screenwriting and adaptations for what they are, that is the aspect that has my respect, I think. This is an incredibly well-made film. It's just the plot isn't something that I gravitate towards. It's interesting because I think that's one of the big things that I noticed. And I'm going to bring up the book a lot because the book is also fresh in my head. But the book in the film kind of plays with, in Harper Lee, the the novel's not at all autobiographical, although much of it is inspired by her life and her father and, you know, things that she saw. What I really noticed in watching this film and reading the book is how she really does talk about in the novel generational racism and trauma And how that trickles down into, you know, the Yules have been poor white trash from this generation to however far back in their history, that there's no escaping that. And even in the novel, Atticus Finch and that family, there's still issues of what we now I think would call white privilege in that relationship. You know, the Scout and Jem, Scout's brother, go to like Calpurnia's church, Calpurnia being their housekeeper who is Black. I think at one point, Harper Lee uses the term or she makes this implication that the kids felt that they were a threatening presence, you know, that they felt like they were scared to be surrounded by assumingly all these people of color. And she's not condemning these characters, but she is talking about there is this racial distinction. And even though these kids are good hearted, and their father is teaching them about racism. It's so hard to escape that for them because everybody in this town exhibits it in some way, you know. And I think that that's really progressive. To Kill a Mockingbird is often considered one of the most banned books. Every school district wants to ban it. And I think a lot of it is those unfortunate truths, Samantha, that you're kind of bringing up, is that for a lot of people, this hits close to home and the wrong people are like, we got to avoid this book because it's showing us who we are. We can't have that. And I think that's really fascinating. I definitely agree. I mean, I all say that it hits home and I, it hits home also in the sense that that's the kind of thing that I was surrounded by growing up even still. And there are still so many aspects and themes of this book that I continue to think about Again, that's why I really dug my heels in reading this. I was like, this is just so me. I I don't want to read myself on paper. (laughs) I don't want to read my life and the things going on around me on paper. That's just not the kind of thing that I seek out. But I completely agree. And a lot of it, I mean, we're dealing with a lot of great social change now. And I'm talking within just the last few years. Up until that point, stuff like that. I mean, and I think stuff like this still will happen. I can only imagine Samantha looking like Mary Badham with the unfortunate shoulder. <laughs> Don't imagine and the coveralls <laughs> and all of that. Tom, what were you going to say? Your Mary Badham comment there makes me say, I don't know if both of you read the news story last week about Mary Badham and that she's now going to be playing Mrs. Mean Old Mrs. Yes. in the national tour. 
I love that. I love the synchronicity that she's come full circle and I saw the play on Broadway, but the tour, I love the idea. I've often, I've often thought that Richard Thomas would be a great Atticus. And I, so I will look forward to seeing him in the role with Mary Battam. I didn't even great. know that that's who was cast. Oh, that's so exciting. I couldn't agree more. That's perfect casting. I love how proud Mary Battam obviously is of her work in the film. And I knew that we definitely weren't going to let this episode pass by without bringing that up. So I'm glad you did. She's terrific in the film. And one of the fun things I did for the book was I had a long interview with the casting director, who was the casting director for the children's role and hearing how Mary got the role and was sort of an amazing, you know, kind of Hollywood story. I love the fact that she was cast as a nine-year-old girl and now she's a 60-something-year-old grandmother and she's back with To Kill a Mockingbird. We should throw out, we were fortunate to sit, well, we had Kim sit down with Mary Badham and do an interview. So that will actually be coming out around the same time as this episode. So people should definitely stay tuned for that. There might even be a sneak peek clip at the end of this episode. We will see. But no, I think Mary Badham is really an unsung talent in the golden era of Hollywood. You know, I know a lot of people know her as Scout. One of the first things I saw was she was Natalie Wood's little sister in This Property is Condemned, which if anybody has not seen that movie and you want to see beautiful people be beautiful together on screen with a Southern accent, you should go watch it because it's great. And I think that really all of the children in this movie, you know, we talk about what's the old Hollywood or the Hollywood adage, never work with dogs and kids. But this movie really makes the argument that there are child actors, whether that's John Megna, who plays Dill. The character was allegedly based on Harper Lee's friendship with Truman Capote or Jem, uh, which is Philip Alford, who is Scout's brother. I love how these kids feel authentic. Sometimes you watch child actors on screen and they are just like adults shrunk down to kid size. They're very prim and proper. And this movie issues all of that, that they are children seeing the world through very innocent eyes. And I love how Mulligan's camera just captures how these kids look at the trial, you know, when they're sitting up in the upper decks watching the trial, or even just the way the camera looks at Gregory Peck from, you know, ground level up at him and creating this magnanimous look to him. It's one of the few movies that I can think of that really does capture, not pander, to the childlike gaze of saying that this is a movie about how children move through the world and how they learn. And, and really, I think that's why the book is so seminal in for, to read for school children, because it really does show how Things like racism, misogyny, stuff like that is often starts as children. You know, it's learned in the home and stuff like that. I appreciate how the camera does really sly, subtle things to remind the audience subconsciously. This is her story. This is her perspective. I would be remiss if I did not give some credit of that to Robert Mulligan because... He also directed some of fellow amazing child actress Natalie Wood's greatest movies as an adult. I mean, he did Love with a Proper Stranger, Inside DZ Clover. I think Robert Mulligan knows how to work with child actresses. Yeah, he directed Reese Witherspoon's first ever movie. So uh, it's all those low camera angles that give you the child's eye view of the proceedings. Another reason why I think it's such a great movie, along with the, of course, very smart decision to film in black and white. As I said before, it's a memory piece and the black and white underscores that, I think, the great production design. This is really, uh, to me, very, very smart filmmaking. I feel like so many black and white films that Kristen and I are used to watching, the ones made in the 40s with that very specific, very overdramatic lighting, they're really works of art. And this is no less a work of art, but it has that realism. It feels like you're looking at an old photograph rather than some, you know, George Harrell piece with a light over here and a light over here. It's got that early 60s filmmaking style where it feels very bright, which I really appreciate that this is a film that takes place 
even though it's in black and white, it's in bright sunlight. Everything is very starkly presented. You know who is good and who is bad. And I think that that all feels very intentional. Like the first image that you see is her drawing with the black marker. And it gives the audience from the first image all you need to know about what this movie is going to be. So Robert Mulligan, man, like, come on, just doing all the things. It also makes me think of Guy Green and A Patch of Blue, for yes. sure. That realistic black and white mid-60s. <laughs> I also think that another fact that uh, it's good for people to remember is that in the end, what saved the film and presented it in the form it's in today is that Gregory Peck had final cut. And because he was not only the star, but he was one of the producers and it was written into his contract. And he and Alan Pakula have both said, as did Mulligan, that the studio wanted to get their hands on it and really re-edit the film. And because of Gregory Peck's contract, they couldn't do that. So uh, we were very, very fortunate that... <laughs> We had a big star who had that power and the sensitivity. We got to talk about Gregory Peck. It's sad that Drea is no longer our co-host because this would have been perfect for her because Greg Peck was her boy. I thought about that, her absolute favorite, and she's not here to discuss him. Exactly. I saw Gregory Peck in other movies before I saw this, and I wonder how much that colored things, like seeing him as this young, romantic, leading man and then seeing him as, like, the ultimate Dilf. I mean, really, I mean, for lack of a better word, I mean, he's everybody's favorite dad. I don't know if he's mine, but, you know, I think what I really, I love about his performance, and again, it feels different than the Atticus in the book, because Harper Lee's Atticus is a bit older, you know, he's creakier. I think there's a scene where, in the book, where Jem wants him to, like, roughhouse or something, and he's like, no, I'm too old for that. I can't handle this. That's obviously impossible when you look at, you know, Gregory Peck, who's just like ridiculously tall and just seems timeless. But I think that what Gregory Peck really brings to this performance is not just the ultimate dad character, you know, the guy that's going to comfort you and has pearls of wisdom, but there are moments of doubt and frustration that you can just see him working in his head. Like, I can't do this. I can't show this to my kids when he's, you know, sitting outside the jail with Tom Robinson and the lynch mob shows up, there's little things you can see on Gregory Peck's face where he's just like, this is going to go horribly right now for me. And I do love, it's one of the few moments of anything passing for levity in this movie when Scout shows up and she says, hey, Mr. So-and-so, I know who you are. You know, she starts naming these horrible racists that she have shown up to kill this man. I love Gregory Peck's performance. I know that the role became synonymous with his entire career, but it's a hell of a role to be associated with. He was uh, very fortunate and he remained grateful. And he said in later years, I know it's going to be the first line in my obituary, and which it was. And he also said, when I got that role, God smiled on me. There's a lot of Gregory Peck in Atticus. There's a lot of Atticus in Gregory Peck, the man. I mean, he really was one of the good guys in Hollywood and a gent and a loving father. And he brought that to the screen. And I think also, and this circles back to Mary Badham's contribution in the film, his interplay with her, she relaxed him. You know, in some Gregory Peck roles, He's a little bit, you know, it's the Mount Rushmore arrow collar man. He's a little stiff, but she really relaxes him on the film. And that's the tenderness you see in their scenes, particularly that great scene on the front porch uh, when she's had a bad day at school and he comforts her and puts his arm around her. There's a, a gentleness and a naturalness to that scene that's really remarkable. I definitely have to mention, uh, number one, Gregory Peck, to me, is the standout in this, for sure. And it's it's one of the best performances, one of the best, best actor performances. And on that note, it's always been my opinion, and when the topic is brought up, I will never not talk about the fact that, in my opinion, 1962 was the most difficult best actor race of all time. So... In case the listeners don't know, the other nominees for Best Actor of 1962 
were Burt Lancaster for Birdman of Alcatraz, considered one of his best. Jack Lemmon for Days of Wine and Roses, which I consider some of his best. Marcello Mastroianni for Divorced Italian Style, easily his best aside from maybe eight and a half. And Peter O'Toole for Lawrence of Arabia, which who doesn't consider that his best? (laughs) So that was incredibly tough. It's hard for me to jump right in and say I wanted Gregory Peck to win. My money is on Jack Lemmon because I think it's just so unlike anything else he did in his career. But I always have to bring that up because that race is insane. I'm glad you brought up Oscars because I was going to say, too, that this was Gregory Peck's fifth and final Oscar nomination. He would get a Gene Herschel Humanitarian Award later in his life, but he was nominated four other times and did not win for Keys of the Kingdom, The Yearling, Gentleman's Agreement, and 12 O'Clock High. I mean, if they were going to give him the Oscar, they had to give it to him for this. But I'm curious, should Gregory Peck have more than one Oscar? I would say yes. He wasn't nominated. I would say if we were going to give him a second Oscar, it would be for either Cape Fear or Roman Mm -hmm. Holiday. Those are weird choices, but I think he should have three. I am on the boat where I think gentlemen's agreement should have definitely been a consideration. It depends on what the competition was that year. I'd have to get his whole filmography in front of me. Yeah, I I have no idea what else was competing. You know what? I'll throw out just again, not looking at his filmography and say that I do think he deserved a nomination for the snows of Kilimanjaro. I really did love him in that. Another as you said, Hemingway adaptation that maybe like, hit the mark. <laughs> but I do love him in it. I think he's really great. To me, where Gregory Peck is at his best, um, we're putting aside Mockingbird. I think that Oscar was deserved. I like Gregory Peck in movies like 12 O'Clock High. You know, Gregory Peck is kind of a perfect looking exterior. The guy is so handsome in the classical sense. He has that great baritone voice. But in something like 12 O'Clock High, you see the cracks underneath the perfect facade. That really interests me. And I think when you see the cracks, you see a bit of who Gregory Peck was in the sense of he was a vulnerable guy. He had a very difficult childhood. And when I was researching my book, I came across a quotation from Gregory Peck's son where he said, it's the vulnerable little boy that I can still see at times that I really respond to. So I think with those great stars, when you see the multi-levels like that, that to me as a film fan is what I find most interesting. It's why I like watching something like 12 O'Clock High. Well, what's surprising to me is obviously, you know, I would say that this movie probably deserved all the Oscars that year. I mean, it depends on the category, but it only won for Peck, art direction for black and white, and the screenplay. It was nominated. Mary Battle was the only other actor in any of the acting categories, which is surprising to me because this is really, I think, an actor's feast, so to speak, with so many of the small, there are no small players, only small parts. So many of the smaller parts played by veterans of television and and people that we now commonly know as amazing talents. I think of the actress who plays Mayela Yule, whose name I can't bring up off the top of my head, in The Twilight Zone. Yes, in in such a memorable episode of The Twilight Zone. Obviously, Robert Duvall in his film role. I just, it boggles my mind that your first film is Boo Radley into Kill a Mockingbird in 1962 with Gregory Peck. I mean, I've never met Robert Duvall, but I feel like if I met him, I would literally say to him like that, your first film, (laughs) do you know that your first film was in 1962 opposite Gregory Peck into Kill a Mockingbird? Do you know that? Because that just shocks me. And I know Boo Radley is a very controversial figure, you know, as somebody who writes about disability a lot. You know, Mm -hmm. Boo Radley has become kind of a pejorative, you know, the town's Boo Radley. The book, I think, does a little bit more to make him feel kind of like a presence, even when he's not on screen. This is not a movie that up until literally he shows up, I'm dry eyed, like I am ready to watch this movie. But the minute 
he reveals himself at the end of the film after he saves Scout and Jem. And she just says, hi, boo. Like, I'm just like, all the feelings just come over me. I don't know who to blame for that. I don't know if that's Robert Mulligan. I don't know if that's the score. I don't know if that's Robert Duvall. But it's everything. Robert Duvall, literally his first film. It just freaks me out. (laughs) It's mind-blowing because a lot of actors couldn't take something that small and turn it into the career that he's had. He is a remarkable actor. And uh, I came across this great quotation when I was researching from Sanford Meisner, you know, the very famous acting coach. And Meisner said, there are really only two American actors, Marlon Brando, whose best work is behind him, and Robert Duvall. I mean, that's the esteem Duvall has been held in. And well, we've seen he's had an incredible, it's just an unbelievable career. You know, Boo Radley is as far from Tom Hagen in The Godfather as you can be. And he's equally convincing in both. So I'm uh, seconding what both of you are saying. I do love that we have you on the show and we're talking about Robert Duvall and he's been in both movies that you have written books on, which I find (laughs) to be a nice little coincidence. I also want to shout out Brock Peters, who who plays our, our poor Tom Robinson. Not a big name, unfortunately, in film, but I think that, again, the courtroom stuff tends to be what draws people in, right? It's the driving narrative of the film. And I think that even though the character is there to be that, you know, poor, poor character that you know it's not going to turn out right for him. And that's what I think is a lot of the intriguing back and forth is that Atticus tries so hard to believe that, like, this is going to turn out well for him. And in the book, there's the character of Miss Maudie, Maudie Atkins, who is not as big a part of the film as she is in the novel, who says like, no, it doesn't really matter. He's going to get a raw deal no matter what happens. Right. You feel for his character again. I think what I appreciate about 60s filmmaking, you know, we always talk about like the method. The method is what revolutionized things. But I think that there was a lot of just more enhanced authenticity. There's a more genuine feel to the acting. And I think that it's conveyed in so many of those courtroom sequences. I actually am a fan of Rob Peters. I really like him a lot. I disagree. I think that especially, we we definitely gave him a solid mention in the Carmen Jones episode. He's really highly regarded. He is in that, yeah. Yeah, so he he was in Carmen Jones. He did Porgy and Bess. He was in Soylent Green even. He definitely had had a certain number of credits, but I agree he should definitely be discussed more. I mean, especially for roles like this where you can just feel every bit of the emotion. His performance in those courtroom scenes is what makes me want to watch this movie. So like everybody from some angle has an appeal, something that that they like about it, I feel. Well, I think what deepens it uh, for me with Brock Peters that I love is the fact that Mockingbird provided Brock Peters and Gregory Peck with a lifelong friendship to the point where when Gregory Peck died, his family asked Brock Peters to deliver the eulogy in church. So that is a real friendship. And that I thought, I think is kind of remarkable. I didn't even know that. That's amazing. Yeah. There's a fantastic quotation from when Brock Peters gave the eulogy at the request of Gregory Peck's family. He ended it. And I just thought this was so beautiful that what Brock Peters wrote, because It spoke to who Gregory Peck was as a person. It really speaks to who Atticus is as a character. And it speaks, in my mind, to To Kill a Mockingbird. And here it is. In art, there is compassion. In compassion, there is humanity. And with humanity, there is generosity and there is love. That's a fantastic and beautiful quotation, I think, that reflects remarkably upon both Brock Peters and Gregory Peck. To be a fly on the wall of that friendship, again, just being like, you know, you're Brock Peters, you're Gregory Peck. We're all hanging out together. Again, I just need a time machine so that I can (laughs) go back in time and start asking all these people, all these questions. One of the 
only criticisms, and I put that in air quotes because I, uh-huh. I don't necessarily think this is a bad thing, but it's something that I certainly miss, is in reading the book, there are so many women characters in the novel. And there's not really a lot of women in the movie that get significant time. You know, mm-hmm. so Miss Maudie Atkins is in the novel is kind of like the female Atticus Finch. She's very much like a foil to him. She's always around. She's giving Scout kind of life lessons as well. And when her house burns down, it's it's really the last time that the townsfolk can all unite for like a common cause. And I really enjoyed those sequences in the book. I wish they'd been maintained in the film somewhat. Calpurnia also gets a bit more in the novel as well. And even though she is she is really great in the film, I just wish that Rosemary Murphy, who plays Maudie Atkinson, and, and Estelle Evans, who's Calpurnia, got a, a bit more screen time. I'm not saying we should remake this movie to give them more screen time. Please do not take that that way. But it's my one critique, is that you know the, the novel, of course, gives these characters a bit more to do. I actually agree. That is an observation that I made watching the film this time around. The first scene that Maude comes on screen, I'm like, wait, there there are women in this? (laughs) I totally (laughs) forgot that. (laughs) So yeah, that's definitely true. I couldn't agree more. Well, that's a very interesting comment. I hadn't really thought about that before. So that's why it's great to talk about these things, to give a- I wonder, yeah. I wonder if I would have noticed if I hadn't been reading the book concurrently. I mean, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, and I think part of that is that if you think about the film, the only traditional intact nuclear family that we see is Tom Robinson's family. No other family is that traditional nuclear family. You know, there's no mother on the scene for the Finch family. So your comment make me think about that a little in a little bit different way. So that's great. Well, I'm often asked, like, what are the untouchable films that we can never remake? And Casablanca gets thrown out a lot. And It's a Wonderful Life, even though they tried, weirdly enough, to make some type of sequel to that, unsanctioned. Uh, this one just, I think, is one of those where I don't really think you can remake it or necessarily need to. Of course, we have the play that is touring the country, which is which is really cool. But this is one of those, I don't know, Samantha, do you think that this is an untouchable movie that should never be remade ever? I tend to agree. Will at some point? Absolutely. I have no doubt that Say they're that. going to remake this no. someday. Especially if the Broadway show does as well as it's set to do. I mean, and, and as well as it already has. And with the relevance of the race relations in this movie, I think it's very likely to be remade. And I hate to break it to you, Kristen. (laughs) I mean, I definitely think that, again, we have that realistic acting nowadays. We have a lot more equal representation in media. If it had to be remade and if it is ever going to be remade, I think it may be handled with the kid gloves that it needs. But we'll see. (laughs) We will definitely see. I also would like to add Gone with the Wind to that list of movies that are... We do not need another Gone with the Wind. I don't think that... I want to say that's never going to happen. I think that's the one that I'm the most confident about, other than maybe Casablanca, as you point out. But who really knows anymore? They're remaking everything these days. (laughs) (laughs) Tom, Samantha, have either of you read the sequel book? The Ghost Set of Watchmen, which is Harper Lee, it was a, allegedly an a earlier draft of this that somebody found and then they published it. The controversy was very high because it pretty much retconned Atticus Finch in a way uh, that we did not want. I didn't read the book. My mom did. She said she was not a fan just because she thought the writing was weak because it's a first draft. I mean, like, you know, her whole thing was like, it's not meant to be anything. So I was just curious if either of you had had read that one. I have read that book several times because I felt I had to in order to really analyze To Kill a Mockingbird, the novel and the movie. And you are absolutely right that it is a it's the first draft of Mockingbird in effect. It's a very different book. Harper Lee wrote Go Set a Watchman. She showed it to her editor 
the editor is re- a woman by the name of Tay Hohoff. And I mention her name because she was so instrumental in shaping what became To Kill a Mockingbird. And also the fact that Harper Lee, who had a hilarious dry sense of humor, talked about Tay Hohoff. Now, you have to picture this. Tay Hohoff, Harper Lee described her as a short woman who was a chain smoker with a gravel voice from Brooklyn who was a Quaker. Now, that is an interesting combination. And she was so determined to shape this material that Harper Lee took to calling Tay Hohoff the Quaker Hitler, which is a hilarious quote. And so Tay Hohoff said, you know, the parts of this that work are the childhood parts in the 30s. What does not work is Scout as an adult in the 1950s. And that's my way of of kind of roundabout way of saying to you. So when I read the book, both times I read it, or or maybe I read it three times, it's really true. The sections in the 30s have a, a gentleness and a lyricism to them that really work. And the sections in the 50s do not at all because it turns into a lecture. The, the fluidity of the writing is no longer there. So I'm not surprised to hear that you haven't read it. Would you ever read it? Or do you think, no, I don't want to? No, I don't. I don't think I want to. I think okay. I think the book is is good enough on its own that I would just know that, you know, maybe as a writer myself, like Mm -hmm. I would just know, like it wasn't really meant to be anything. So of course, of course, it's not as great. Right. For me, I feel like effectively capturing the mind and inner workings of a child and putting it on paper is something so unique Mm -hmm. that in comparison, an adult in the fifties, like everybody does that nowadays. That's so commonplace to read. Right. And I think a lot of the the uniqueness and the real bolt of lightning is kind of taken out of the equation. I -hmm. imagine I have not read it. The other reason I'll be honest that I don't want to read it is the controversy surrounding it. If it's not something that Harper Lee intended, then they're intended to be out and intended for us to read. Then I don't know if I should read it. If she has well, banned it, now if other people ban it, then I'm going to read it. <laughs> well, I think, you know, that was part of the controversy was because it was published near the end of her life when she had macular degeneration, so she couldn't really see and she couldn't hear very well at all. The controversy was, did she understand what was going on? And because I read so much of the background about it, I came to the conclusion that she would understood that that book was being published. I think the drawback is, as you said earlier, it's the first draft. It was published as she wrote that. So it's an unedited manuscript. So with her meticulous standards, I think it it falls short because editors are important to books and there was no editor. So I do want to shout out Scout's ham costume, which is still utterly hilarious. I will say that that entire sequence is up there with the Margaret O'Brien Halloween scene in Meeting St. Louis as kind of my favorite examples of like spooky Halloween stuff in classic film. So I I needed to shout that out. (laughs) By all means, a ham costume is always worthy of attention. So uh, I thought it was so adorable too, truly. And the fact that it kind of plays as a plot point is crazy. (laughs) I mean, obviously, I think we all agree. I mean, I don't know, maybe Samantha, you have a different opinion. But I mean, I would say that To Come Mockingbird is one of those, the film, I've come to appreciate it and, and enjoy it far more than I think I did when I first saw it as a teenager. Even though it's made in the 1960s as the studio system is starting to die, it does have that old Hollywood wits to it. People always ask me, like, what are the perfect encapsulations of old Hollywood? And I usually say... Casablanca, Mildred Pierce, A Place in the Sun. And I would say this. I mean, I think that there are a lot of commonalities that make this a good entry for people who don't know about classic cinema. And everything is is great about it. I would have liked, yes, compared to the book, I would have liked some more ladies. So I recommend everybody read the book. It's quick. If you didn't already read it in high school, um, it's it's definitely worth a reread. So I, I'm happy that we got to 
talk about it again. Samantha, what are your overall thoughts on To Kill a Mockingbird? I absolutely do recommend it as a film. I think it's a brilliant film. Obviously, the the screenplay and the cinematography and the directing and the acting all hit their marks completely. I would, yeah, definitely recommend it. Just maybe not to someone like me who <laughs> wants that escapism, wants something like otherworldly, like the Astaire and Rogers musicals come to mind. <laughs> It doesn't have that opulence and fantasy, of course not. But for what it is, I think it's groundbreaking. It's so important today to really revisit these kinds of stories, I think. And I definitely think that that's why it's being shown on Broadway too. But, but yeah, I would absolutely recommend the film. I think it's great. Tom, final thoughts? I would have two final thoughts on the topic. The first one is that I think the continuing power of the novel, but also the film, because we're talking about the film, is, is shown in the fact that one of the very last addresses that President Obama gave to the nation right before he left office, he quoted from To Kill a Mockingbird. And he talked about the fact that the book and the movie are both loved in his household. He said that. And he said, if our democracy is ever going to work, it would behoove us to remember the words of Atticus Finch, one of the great characters of all time. You never really know a man until you walk around in his skin. So the fact that our president said that as one of his last official statements, I thought really showed the enduring power of, of the novel and the film. And the second and then the last point I would make is it really struck me that a few years back in one of the American Film Institute polls, Atticus Finch was voted the greatest American film hero of all time. It was not a John Wayne cowboy. It was not somebody from Star Wars. It was the character of a 1930 small town Alabama lawyer. And I think if that was the result of the poll in the 21st century, that speaks to a very good first-class film. Exactly. Well, Tom Santo Pietro, author of the amazing book, Why to Kill a Mockingbird Matters, thank you so much for sitting down and talking with us about Gregory Peck and Robert Duvall and all these amazing actors in this amazing movie. Feel free to share where fans can get in touch with you on social media, what you have coming out, where your books are, all of that. My very easy answer for that is my website, which is my name, TomSentoPietro.com, has all of that information. So there, it's sort of one-stop shopping. I've really enjoyed speaking with both of you. It's nice to uh, look. I love these old films so much that it's really nice to talk and share it with other people that have great knowledge and love it as well. So thank you both. That's going to close out this edition of Ticklish Business. Again, we want to send a thank you to Tom Santo Pietro, author of Why to Kill a Mockingbird Matters, for being on with us. As always, if you enjoy what you are listening to, you can follow us on all social media platforms. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. If you just search Ticklish Biz, we will pop up. Our Twitter is at ticklish underscore biz. We are also on the internet with our amazing website, ticklishbiz.com, where we have all sorts of writing and reviews of years past that you can check out. We are going to be giving away some prizes at the upcoming TCM Classic Film Festival, so be sure to keep listening to us as we give out more details as we get closer to that. We'll also be doing some contests on our Instagram, so be sure to follow us there if you aren't already. And we also have a YouTube channel where we have videos that you can watch as well as video versions of these episodes. And if you want to help us keep the lights on and get some great access to bonus reviews of stuff like Being the Ricardos, West Side Story, we also do two whole bonus shows about true crime, old Hollywood films, and movies that have been remade again, you can go over to patreon.com slash ticklishbiz and get all sorts of fun stuff, including free merchandise. But we will be back next time. Till then. Hey, don't close out this podcast just yet. This is Kim here. As mentioned in the podcast, keep listening for a sneak peek of my interview with the Academy Award nominated star of To Kill a Mockingbird, Mary Batum. The full audio is now available to all Ticklish Business Patreon subscribers. 
However, anyone can swing by our website at ticklishbiz.com to read the transcript. Now, on to the sneak peek. Bob Mulligan, our director, was an absolute incredible director. And he started off very gently with us because none of us were film kids. We weren't actors. And Philip, who played Jim and John Magna, John was the only, he had done some work in New York. He was from New York. And he was familiar with the film industry because his sister, I think it was his, one of his sisters was Connie Stevens. Oh, really? Yeah. So he, I think, was a little bit familiar with it, but Philip and I totally were not. So they started off with cameras and equipment across the road, and then they would move up and get closer because we did all exteriors first. And then we moved into the studio and worked on interior shots. And it was just so much fun. We just, I mean, Mr. Mulligan made it playtime. It was just very easy. He was very gentle with us and he never talked down to us. He would, you know, squat down in front of us and give us a lay of the land of where the camera was going to be and, you know, kind of what he, where he wanted us to go and what he wanted to, to, us to do. But after that, you know, he turned us loose and let us do our work mm-hmm. uh, uh, and say our lines. And if he found later he needed to tweak it, he'd tweak it. But For the most part, he just let us do our job, and it was just so much fun. That's awesome to hear. He's been one of my favorite filmmakers since college, so I I definitely wanted to hear your experience working with him. He's somebody who I truly think never received the due he deserved. He was such a beautiful director. Exactly. I, I could not agree more. When I talk about direction with film students and students in general who are interested in film and theater, because it crosses over as far as theater goes as well, that if you over-direct, if you give too much, then what's the point of hiring the people Mm -hmm. you've hired? They need to show you their interpretation of that character knowing full well the full implication of what they're doing. Exactly. Uh, You know, you have to see what they're going to give you first. And who knows? It may be something that you never thought about. You know, it may have been something that didn't come through on the read-through, but can be magical when you leave them alone. And I think we had quite a few of those moments in Mockingbird But Bob was good, though. I mean, he really, he knew how to get the reactions he wanted. And I'll give you a couple of examples. One was, if you think back to the scene with Boo Radley's father, when he comes around the tree and he's going to cement up the tree. Mm -hmm. And Bob Mulligan had Philip and I there were concentrating on these things that we've taken out of the knot hole and we're, you know, deep in conversation. And you know how when you concentrate really hard, you're not aware always of what's going on around you. And he had him come around. And when he takes that trowel and hits that board with the cement on it, Mm -hmm. and then we look up, and who do we see but Boo Radley's dad? It scared us to death because we know it's going to be there. That was not part of our introduction to the scene that we were going to be doing. It was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant so that he could get those wonderful moments. The other one was the the Hey Boo scene where I'm standing by the bedstead and he didn't set the scene up completely. He just said, you're going to stand there and then you're going to say your line. Well, when they opened the door and there was Bob Duval, that was the first time I'd ever seen him. And it was just really I to say, well, hey, boo. (laughs) He never let us see the other actors out of character, out of costume and makeup. Really? After we were completely finished with their filming. 
we never saw them until the minute we were working with them. Kept keeping was, that illusion almost yeah, for you. Exactly, exactly. 